the only way we're going to fix this is by changing laws because we can't just sit on it. Something has to be drastic enough to change a law to save lives. I wholeheartedly believe it. Welcome to Invisible Not Broken. Today, we are talking about opioids and pain protocol, clinic negligence, and tech for disability advocacy. Our host, Monica, is joined by activist Kim Luke, who lives with multi-level spondylosis, POTS, and fibromyalgia. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Invisible Not Broken. I completely have to admit to Twitter stalking Kim Luke. She wrote an amazing tweet about chronic pain and the opioid issues we are dealing with. And one of my pet projects and desperate need for is bringing chronic pain people together. I would love for you to tell me about how this all started. What got you on this journey into looking at chronic pain and opioids? Well, I had a multi-level lumbar spinal fusion in 2018 with cadaver bones and cages. And that's a massive surgery, first of all. So they wheeled me back to the room and my best friend who was a RN, BSN, been in the healthcare field for a very long time, witnessed me in full pain delirium. Now, I'll tell you why. Because they were trying to give me a gabapentin and Tylenol. The pain protocol per this surgery, I should have had an ongoing pain pump to regulate my pain. I'm sorry for my look of absolute terror and horror, but... Oh my God. I can't imagine what you went through in that hospital bed. Oh my God. So the full pain delirium, I do not remember. She said, she said, I jumped out of bed. Who jumps out of bed after a, a lumbar spinal season? And then is screaming and crying in pain, asking for help or pain medicine. She's advocating and fighting with the doctors, trying to get me some help. The staff was so negligent. I mean, I, I was projectile vomiting, diarrhea. I mean, this continued. I couldn't eat. They didn't do DVT cuffs. They let a JP drain bleed all over me in the bed twice. I mean, the negligence was so severe. And me being in that, you know, non-patient rights and medical field and having actually advanced knowledge of what I gone to school for. Because how, you were how, actually in the medical field, right? When this happened? Yes. I knew what they were doing was just horrifically negligent patient abandonment and just negligence. And then the pain, the uncontrolled pain just was unbelievable. I I even had the resident push me because I wasn't moving fast enough for him to see the scar. I I literally told these people, I said, you're going to discharge me. And they go, okay, we'll discharge your AMA. And I said, no, you won't discharge me AMA. I said, you're going to discharge me regular or I will have an attorney down here in 30 minutes. So they discharge me regularly. Well, real quick, because we have an international audience and love you all who have actual medical bills that don't ruin you in other countries. But if you leave a hospital AMA, that changes if your insurance will pay or not. So that's why this is a big deal is you can't even leave a situation where you're being abused in a hospital or a doctor's situation. You can't just advocate for yourself by leaving because if you leave AMA, and we're not talking about $1,000, we are talking like 200, 300, 400 to a million dollars of a bill that you will have to pay. And I don't know about your state, but here in my state, they can attach your house. So if you go in in an emergency, if you're flown into a hospital here, if you're a homeowner, attach your house to that bill. So I just want to make that really clear for international audiences when when she's saying like, if people are like, why didn't you just leave as soon as you could? Well, here's why. It could financially ruin you. Thank you for explaining that to everybody. That's what we need to do is educate the public because they're not educated because the people that we're supposed to educate them have failed them. Yes. Well, and also, how are you going to think of these things? If you're in a horrible car accident and they're like, we're going to take a chopper, a helicopter. And we're going to put you in it and we're going to rush you to the hospital. You're not in a position to then go, is that going to cost $40,000? Because that's what it costs is $40,000. And also where you're coming from, are you going to think to ask about, you know, as you're being rushed into emergency surgery, what is your pain protocol after the surgery? Are you going to be, how would you even think to ask that? Because you think that your doctors will do the best thing possible for you. And that is no longer true after this whole opioid hysteria. Oh my God, correct. It was at the peak, I guess, in 2018. I never thought that would happen to me. I didn't even question it. I thought I'd get proper pain protocol. I had a TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack, which is a mini stroke. So not only did I have complications of pain delirium, 
I had a mini stroke because I was not properly medicated pain wise. And when I got out of there, a couple of days later, I was in a hospital and I, tr- I was trying to manage this myself and it wasn't working. Oh my goodness. It was like three or four days. And up in another hospital, I, my pain was so horrific. They didn't give me any pain pills, mind you. It was a 10 plus, plus, plus. I was still projectile vomiting. I end up in the ER. The doctor said I was malnourished, anemic. I'd lost 15 pounds in, what, four days? A large seroma on my spine. And he came back in my room. He goes, oh my God, who did this to you? That's the first thing he said. When you mentioned another doctor, did he shut down or was he willing to hear that? Because I've had a lot of these situations happen where the doctors are like, oh, another doctor, we can't even talk about that. And just sort of close ranks around each other. Did you have someone who was able to discuss it? Yes. My God. This doctor was my savior. Thank God for him. He said, who did this to you? He was like astounded. I said, if you can get my pain level to a seven, I'd be happier than hell. And seven is still high. And he goes, oh, no, I can do better than that. We'll get, get you to a six from where you're at. And he did. It was amazing. He gave me proper pain protocol. I stopped projectile vomiting. I was able to eat. I don't understand our romanticization, especially here in the United States, of like bootstrapping and bootstrapping around pain because it's counterproductive. If you are in agony, you can't do physical therapy. If you are in agony, you can't do the things you need to to take care of yourself and other people. I don't get this idea of like, I'm awesome because I denied myself the ability to actually try to get better in the best possible way. Correct. What people don't realize is there is invisible diseases out there. There's a lot of rare complex neurological diseases or whatever anatomy or system is breaking down in your body. There are people that require pain medication to function. And literally, we cannot get out of bed if we don't have these pain meds. I mean, there's no quality of life, period. You're homebound already. And then they're fighting you on your pain medication. Keeps you at least semi-active. And on multiple fronts, because now your pharmacist can just deny you. Even if you have your, your script from your pain doctor, your pharmacist can go, yeah, no. Oh, now we're having supply change shortages. Oh my God, four days, no painkillers. It was four days of me screaming in the back room like some sort of Victorian woman <laughs> locked in an attic with yellow wallpaper and because they were like, supply chain issue, what can you do? And often as chronic pain patients, we go through this. Our pain's going to just shoot so far off the wall that we are bedridden, like you said, screaming, crying. And it continues to happen because they'll feel it, like you say, in the four days, maybe you'll have it for a month and then another month you you won't get it because the provider decided to drop it or the pharmacy didn't have it, like you said, for two weeks or like what, what I've had, you know what I'm saying? I've gone a month, I've gone two weeks, I've gone four days and it's, it's never consistent. And they won't give you more than 30 days of your pills. So you can't Uh even try to stock up for a buffer for when this happens or your drug seeking. Now for you, were you, was this a sudden thing? Was this an injury or was this from something longer term? Yeah, this was an injury. Uh Oh my gosh. Oh, my theory, like a lot of us are chronic pain from birth on. I have a genetic disorder and I feel like that was so much easier than if you just suddenly get thrown into this world. Like if you are the frog in the hot water, it's almost easier. You develop these coping mechanisms from childhood. I cannot imagine being in your position, being thrown into this world during the height of the opioid freakout. You have all of my sympathy and empathy. Oh, honey, well, well, yours as well, having it genetically, you know. There's so so many things at play here that we 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 have to deal with. I'm um, so proud of you for like trying to create some activism around this because we had so many people like JD Vance. We had Hollywood do dope sick. Like we didn't have enough stress trying to get our medication. And no one is doing this other side. Regular people just trying to get their medication to survive. And I feel like this is such an important issue, just like disability, because we are the one little group of people who anyone can get a membership to at any moment, anything can change and you can get cancer. And now you're a part of this opioid conversation. I watched my father in hospice last year die of a pancreatic cancer. And it took me two days of watching my father 
scream and writhe to ask what he was on because I had assumed this is hospice. They are giving him the really intense stuff. But I found out he was on a lower dose than I was. And it, it just breaks me because I don't think people realize that this conversation everyone's having actually includes everyone. Yes. And the community that's targeted the most is the vulnerable, elderly, disabled, chronic pain patients, chronically ill, invisible rare diseases. Anybody that's hard to deal with, we are thrown out like trash. Oh my gosh, yes. Complete trash. We are a number. We are in the way. Like, they don't care to treat us. That this is not okay. The atrocities that I witnessed and was subjected to along this last five years, this journey, you would be astounded. I have... I'll have to send it to you. It's a priority level one for harmful safety negligence in a sniff. I won the state with AZDHS. I won wow. was vindicated. It's huge. It's huge. I saved so many more lives. What was going on in there? Rape, fraud, corruption, abuse. What I saw was so horrific. I kept a running journal of occurrences and dates and times. They started writing class three prescriptions in my name after I was discharged from this SNF, totally destroying my reputation because it, it, it goes against the pain. Everybody that looks it up and sees how many times you fill up pain meds. You know how they look at Or their... your pets. Also, by the way, everyone, just to be aware, your pets, if you take your pet to the vet and your pet is prescribed an opioid, that does go onto your record as someone who got the opioids. Just want to make sure everyone's aware of that one because that was a surprise to me. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. So they were stealing patients' pain meds. They were writing these scripts in their names. My name, I found out, it, you know, it'll, it'll ruin your reputation. Well, and you were working in healthcare, which would get you fired immediately. I, so I had to fix this. Multiple police reports. How did you do that? How were you able to fix this? Like, I am blown away by your ability to do things while you've been dealing with your post-stroke. You've been dealing with tremendous levels of agony and a huge life-changing event. How did you, what resources were you able to access to be able to do this? You know, when I was going through the worst time in my life when they, they disabled me, malpractice negligence, extreme. They destroyed my life. So I'm in this horrible sniff, right? And I see what's going on and it fueled me because I've always taken care of people all my life. I'm a licensed cosmetologist first. And then I got my medical first responder. Then I worked fire. Then I worked ER. I worked IV tech. You know, I worked a lot of jobs and I've taken care of patients and I know how to take care of patients and I'm ethical and the, I do right by the patients, right? What I saw was so horrific, the abuse that was happening to people, the suffering, and people stealing pain meds for their own use and taking it away from the patient. And these patients not knowing anything because they're trapped in a sniff and they're elderly and they're abused. Oh, can you used. explain real quickly what a sniff is? Yes. So a SNF is a skilled nursing facility. It's supposed to provide 24-7 skilled nursing care, nutrition, medications. They have a doctor on staff, you know. And so other countries, please understand that when we're talking about this, this is not free. This is not paid for by our taxes. If you're lucky enough to have insurance, that will cover this. Yay you. But we are talking about, I think here it was like 20000 a month when I last looked at how much that would be. And the amount of abuse that happens in these facilities is well documented. We're not just talking out of our hats. We're not talking about a very isolated experience. If you want to look this up, it is very underreported. And what you will find will be just jaw-droppingly shocking. It is something that we really do need to change. Absolutely. You said it. That perfectly said. I mean, it's, it's a crisis. It's, it's horrific what's going on. I witnessed it firsthand. So I just started researching, researching who I could report this to and that, you know what I mean? All the government entities, I started researching. Ombudsman, FTC, insurance, ACC, DHS, anywhere from our elected officials. I've gone to the president. So when you were looking at these people and you say you went to them, were you sending them letters? Were you? Yes. Complaints and grievances. I was reporting everything that was going on. 
And that's how I won the priority level one, which thank God AZDHS did their job because that place should have been shut down. But you can look up the citations and everything that were and the allegations that were founded. And then it continued to snowball. So from being put on Medicare and Medicaid, I was judged, discriminated against. I had doctors picked by the government that would not help me. They would not help my pain. I would go to so many pain specialists, you know, your doctor shopping. Well, you got a doctor shop to find the right doctor that's going to treat you. And not be condescending or cruel or even listen to you. That's not going to gaslight you. That's not going to, that's going to actually treat you. Yes. Yep. That's not going to abandon you, leave you untreated. I mean, there's so many things we can go in asking questions to these doctors before we, we take them on. Because if they're not suitable for us, we need to move on and get someone that will take care of us. Or one of the things I've been seeing is a trend that's happening lately is pain clinic doctors forcing us into very painful and very ineffective surgeries or medical procedures before they will prescribe opioids. Even if we've tried these procedures before, they have not worked. They want us to do like some of these procedures on me, which I've tried before as a teenager, and they are horrible, terrifying. And instead of just prescribing what I know works, what I'm not allergic to, it was this huge fight. And, you know, have it help you. If you're not, if you're listening to us and you're not watching this, we are two very pale women and we're being treated like this. So if you do not look like this, you are going to have a harder time. And I've noticed that my friends who are have more body weight on them were getting treated far worse by the same pain clinic doctors. And it's just the amount of arbitrary racist, misogynist bullying that happens in these clinics is insane. And like you said, we can't talk back because if we do, we can get cut off. We can get bullied by not being able to pick up our prescriptions. It's, it, it really, I've never felt this helpless and I've been in some pretty bad situations in my life, but the last five years have been terrifying. Yes. And it's everywhere. It's everywhere. We're in different states and we're experiencing very similar experiences. They're pushing not evasive procedures that actually cause more harm than good. What is the one that they want to put in? The electric stimulator. My friend just had that done. Yeah, the, for her CRPS. Oh, that did not go well. There are so many people that, that have had severe complications from that. One of the other issues is a lot of us have allergies, like mass, I have mass activation disorder and the amount of gaslighting, never boring, never bored. I'm always a curiosity, but the gaslighting is for one experience. Explaining, look, my body won't react well to this material in this patch. And the doctors be like, no, it's going to be just fine. So she actually gave herself an allergic reaction by wearing jewelry with that metal in it. And her whole arm blew up and the doctor abandoned care. And she yeah. was just left with like, but I'm still in pain, but I just didn't want you to put something inside me that causes blistering on the outside. Like, it's so hard to advocate. I am so frustrated by a very similar language I hear between like when a, when a person is in an abusive relationship mm -hmm. and that sort of will just leave, just advocate for yourself. I feel like we're starting to get very similar language thrown to us of just advocate for yourself, just leave. And it's like, that's not really a possibility. There's very few pain clinic doctors now. Most of the pain clinics are either shutting down. Lots of doctors are leaving that practice. It's very hard to find someone. And I'm in a city. If you're rural, this has got to be way harder and you can't get your medication delivered and you have to go into the clinics. So this is a massive issue for people with mobility who are experiencing oh poverty. God. Like this is a catastrophe. And it almost seems like, uh, well, that's nice if you can get it, but you aren't owed care. Yeah. And this and the fact that this topic is so huge and millions are suffering and wrongfully yes. dying because of the, the negligence. And this should be a number one priority that should have already been addressed and fixed, but they're not even looking at it. It seems way more politically active to go the other side. This is politicized. It's completely politicized. That's what happened to healthcare. What can you do? I got a red flag on me. I cause trouble because I advocate. I'm professional. I go in there. I do emotionally overreact. I have factual evidence. And boom, I have it on them. And they, every single time, then they're like, oh, we're going to retaliate against her. 
we're not going to give her this or we're not going to give her that. And if they think I'm going to bow down, they're insane because this needs to be something that is viral, that people are aware of that is a huge, huge crisis. And the amount of suffering and death that's going on is just unbelievable. We did just win the Supreme Court decision of that the pain clinics are liable for us. It was a, a man who did not survive his pain clinic's actions. Let me just put it that way in a parking lot. And his family sued and that actually went all the way through the Supreme Court and the family was awarded because the pain clinic did not act responsibly. So we do have a little bit of legal power right now. So what do we do with that? You want to build a coalition of chronic pain patients. What what do you want to do? What are you working towards? We're going to change laws. Hey, how do we do that? Well, if we get enough to back us and support us, then we get representatives. You know what I mean? Go to Congress, the Senate, and we pass bills. I started a petition. I don't know if you saw that. That details a lot of what negligence was happening and what patients were going through. And I had to detail that out. And that includes chronic pain patients. That includes everybody. The only way we're going to fix this is by changing laws. Because we can't just sit on it. Something has to be drastic enough to change a law to save lives. I wholeheartedly believe it. And the reason is, is because we don't have protection as patients. The doctors have all the protection. The lawyers that are in bed with the doctors, they all have the protection. There is no protection for the patients whatsoever. Yeah, I think that we forget what the ADA had to do. Like to get the ADA, we had to do civil disobedience to get that very weak, but at least it's a step up past. We did have to march on the Capitol and crawl up steps to get people to notice. Yes. I tell people it's a, a big hill to climb, but it's worth every bit of it because in the end, it just kills me. I'm tired of seeing so much pain and suffering and death and experience it myself. I mean, they've left me untreated. I'm not even on the right pain protocol. I shouldn't have higher med. You know what I mean? I don't have that. And they can visibly see that I'm in a lot of pain with my records alone. Something has to be done. Even my doctors, I have a very kind pain management doctor, but even he is I've never seen anyone look so wanted and sad because he has to do things a certain way, which is leaving me in agony. And he does not want me to be in agony, but he has his hands tied. And it's getting to this point where my doctor doesn't get to make choices for me. Now there are a whole bunch of lawyers, politicians, and now pharmacists that get to have a say in whether I get to have any sort of quality of life. And by quality of life, I mean sitting up in bed. Yes, And that's what people don't understand is the depth of it. That's exactly what it is. Because I feel like a lot of people who talk about this, like we just had this doctor from Canada who went viral on Twitter saying, I just broke my foot and I didn't take any opioids. It's like, okay, well, number one, I, I don't know what you want me to say for that. All I'll say is, I'm sorry you broke your foot. That sounds very painful. Number two, are you sure you don't want to take something so that you can ramp up your physical therapy to get better sooner. And um, number two, I'm not going to give you a medal for that. Like, and you know your pain's going to end. You broke your foot. Hopefully you will get better and that will stop. But for a lot of us, it is like when we talk about getting down to a seven or a six, we're not being facetious. That's a good day for me as a six. Like my 24 seven is an eight. That's my average. We understand each other because we live that on a daily basis. Basis. And whenever I go into the hospital and I have some poor little adorable intern go, so what's your pain level? And I'm like, all right, so we need to have a talk real fast. Your pain level or my pain scale? Because we're going to be talking about two very different things. And I need you to understand that I don't scream until I get to a 10. Like nine and a half is where I start really showing it. So like, and it's a conversation you have to have because some people who live regular 
expected lives do not experience significant levels of ongoing pain most of their lives. So they don't understand that. Like I even met a doctor who said, there's no way you can be in pain for 20, 24 seven. I was like, oh, my friend, let us chat. Yes, you can. I was like, oh, cool. Why are you like sit in my body for like, oh, naive, so naive. Of and that less doctor. of some are children. Like, no, actually we can and we are. And we actually still do really cool, amazing things. If we have enough medication that allows us to go beyond the thought of screaming. All we're asking for is quality of life and we deserve it. That's our right. And we should be able to have that. There's absolutely no excuse. That's a beautiful line. Right there, it kills your tagline is we deserve a quality of life unapologetically. Like that's just it. Like that's all we're asking. I will actually add one little thing on to what I would love to add to that statement is I would like honest numbers because we can't make choices unless we understand the statistic numbers. And when they did these numbers, they included people who had previous addiction issues. Correct. That should not even be in play. This does not coincide with people that have rural diagnoses or are using. And... and then with the death numbers, they included people who are in hospice care. So that really doesn't feel honest or genuine. And that's where, you know, it's really important that we understand to ask better questions about the numbers and the headlines. Correct. I am really excited for this because I do think the only way to change things is for people to come together and to be open and honest. There's nothing shameful about needing medication. That is not something to be quiet about, especially right now. So we've seen when so many medical issues where people are out actually talking about their vulnerable and intense experiences. This is important if you can, if you're safe enough to, to talk about this because there's just this very weird mentality on people who have not experienced this on what we are like and what we are doing. So if we are loud and we band together, I think that's kind of the only way for change. Absolutely. Our community deserves to have a quality of life, but to be treated fairly. And I'm so tired of seeing the disabled community, the chronic pain community, us being just treated like trash. I, that is so discriminatory. It's so negligent and it is not fair. It's absolutely not okay. And, you know, we want to do something to fix it. Well, I'm going to do whatever I can. I'll tell my story. I will advocate for others. I have been. What are some of the things you would recommend for, for teaching, for advocating? It's not something that comes natural to me. So I'm very intrigued on how to do this better. Well, knowledge is power, right? So the more we educate ourselves, the better off we are. So I tell people, I'm not going to do all the work for you. You have to do some work, but I'll give them pointers like research this, research that, you know, depending on what they are needing. There was a guy that needed a doctor's appointment. He hadn't had an eye appointment for a year, right? He was supposed to have one and the social worker never put it in. So I wrote it out and I said, go hand this to the social worker. She was fired the next day and he had an appointment because he was completely abandoned and neglected. He waited a whole year for an eyeglass appointment. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, very much. I try to teach people that when you go into a doctor, have a medical journal, first things first, and write down a whole bunch of questions. And then you're going to answer a whole bunch of questions and then write everything down, write down everything that was said from the doctors, the time, the date, get the information that you can from the doctor, whatever you can. Do this each time you go to a provider. That is wonderful advice. And if you're an Apple user or an Android user, Google Keep is a really good app for this, for just keeping track Ooh. of everything. Reminders is another very good app, depending on which one. I do a whole thing on technology and disability. And what you're saying is so imperative for so many reasons and so many different aspects of just keeping track of what's going on and just like for me, I have Eller Stainless as well. So it's dislocation. So keeping track of what was dislocated when. Number one gives us a really good idea of what's happening at various points of time and why and when and more likely dislocate. But it's yes. also very helpful for this and able to, when you're going in to make a case, which weirdly you have to make a case for your pain meds, this helps. And then if you go to physical therapy, having your physical therapist write what you're doing also is a very helpful thing for getting 
your pain medication because to be able to do physical therapy to even have a chance to get better, you have to be at a pain level that you can manage the exercises. Otherwise, it's not even a mind over matter issue. It is your body will stop you from having that range of motion you need to get better. You will not win a bootstrapping. Like there is no trophy at the end of this. Your goal should be a healthy body. And the wild idea that we're taking these meds and then partying is one of the funniest things, I, like the saddest, funniest thing I've ever heard of. I'm a mom. Mm-hmm. Um, who takes care of animals and kids. And I'm really excited if I have enough pain meds to help out with house chores. That's my big party is to help my husband with some house care. I, I, if we could create a hashtag and we just start showing what our day-to-day lives are like as an opioid user, it's not nearly as glamorous as I think J.D. Vance would like us to be. I first off can't fit into Daisy Dukes. So that's just out. And it's going to show that law-abiding citizens, they're not using or abusing the drugs. These are people that need it. And this is yes. how we live. And like a two minute video or whatever you can put up there. Yes. Hashtag. Absolutely. A journal. Any social media, brilliant people help us out here. Or hey, if you're in Hollywood, you know, it'd be a great storyline for one of your medical shows. This. There's another thing. Why hasn't someone done a story on this? There are so many of us. That's a compelling storyline. Everything you could possibly want right there. I answered my own question because we know why we're tossed out, discarded. And there's absolutely no reason. But to get back to the book, I have to tell you the journal or the Google. I have all my doctors, all my diagnoses, everything in there. You have all that in there. And then when you go to the Peace Fest Bullets, I brought all my records. I had everything laid out. Boom. Here you go. It makes life so much easier. You will be more appreciative of it. But you're also prepared and you can go in there without forgetting stuff because I forget stuff all the time. Yes. And we do. And it's like brain fog, blow, you know? And then I'm like, oh, it's right here and here. I have it. You know what I mean? If I didn't have that, I would be screwed. So it's so important to keep a paper patrol, dates, times, a journal. Or like you said, the app, I got to get that Google one. I will Um, show it to you. It's one of my favorite or like keeping track of anything, but any tech geniuses out there, there are billions of us with chronic illness who need this app, which would include all of our doctor's info, a calendar that we can easily and simply and intuitively, by the way, and you should be intuitive, write down what our symptoms were for that day and what medications were on. All of this would be an incredible app. And I, you would make a lot of money. You would make a lot of people safer and happier. And you're absolutely right. When you can show an ER doctor how organized you are, it is one of the fastest ways to credibility with doctors I've found. Absolutely. If you can show that. You why not go in prepared. Yes. Yes. And that's the way you advocate too. And that's the way you make sure you don't forget stuff. Which I also hate because I feel like it's back to this idea of we have to present in one particular way to get credibility. We can't show emotion. We can't show fear. All these things we have to like present this like Taylor Swift at a at her court hearing calm, hearing everything while we're in pain. But you're right, we have to. Otherwise, that's our vulnerability there. It's it's so true because they'll deem you on any little thing if you're having a bad day or you, oh, she's depressed. And getting back to the racism again, which I think is also a very important point here, is there are still medical textbooks that claim that certain races have a higher tolerance of pain. And there are textbooks that will tell you that people born with ovaries can handle more pain. And but I don't know. It it's just makes me out of vomit. I mean, anecdotally, ask anyone who has gone to the same doctor as a different gendered spouse, and they will tell you, most of them, that the men have gotten pain meds so much faster. Like when my father got sick, you would have thought house was in the building. Every single specialist, every doctor, everyone wanted to run every test. And it was just like all this respect, which is what my father deserved. But when I got sick, it was like, oh, sweetie. Are you feeling stressed or did you need more attention? And it was like, I believe no, I had CRPS. I had Eller stainless and fibromyalgia and POTS and mast cell activation disorder. And it took me until I was 36 to get the Eller stainless diagnosis. How do they test that? They were going to test me for that. So first it was, I had CRPS when I was 16. And it was only diagnosed because they wanted to put me into a mental hospital because 16 year olds don't hurt like that. See, that's what they do. That's another thing I would love to talk about. 
And we can't, I mean, like, I, I don't often talk about this, but I don't mind talking about this. I've been through sexual abuse for most of my childhood. And because that was documented, it was the first thing when I was in pain that they'd be like, oh, you're crazy. And they would point to that. A lot of people's pain will get dismissed for psychological reasons. The only reason I got any help was because it was insisted by my mother who went full mama bear. And they did the anti-nuclear test and it showed only like one little inch of blue in a sea of red and orange. And the like, they're like, okay, there's definitely a problem. We're going to, oh my goodness. I was not given opioids after that, by the way, for my chronic regional pain. I was given a sciatic nerve suppression I, and they didn't give me anything after that to take care of it. It was a very traumatic experience. It had to be redone. We don't have to go into that detail. But what I'm saying is, is like, the under-medicating causes long-term fear and post-traumatic stress. Like, this is not hyperbole. This is trauma. It also has shown, even in articles, untreated pain or improper pain protocol has caused significant harm on a patient, further injuring them, further illness, because like the TIA or the trauma and the complications that will ensue, it's absolutely insane what we are witnessing. We're still expected to carry on a meaningful life. There's no piece out where you get to just sort of like lounge on a bed and eat bonbons. We're still expected to keep a life going and our advocacy for ourselves, which is just a dizzying and stressful amount of stuff in my mind and feeling. Right. Have you ever heard of the flat effect? You know, what's that? Okay. So the flat effect comes when you experience so much pain like we do on a daily basis, mm. but we're so used to it that we present with just the flat effect like this. Mm -hmm. And even if we're experiencing high, high pain levels, we're still people because we're so used to being untreated or in high pain levels that you you just get to that flat point because it just makes us so miserable. Well, it's not going to stop. Like, what's going to make this stop? Either I've already taken my pain meds, which I'm not prescribed enough to take as often as I need. So it's this constant, like, am I hurting? Sadly, they don't give enough to get on top of your pain so that you can level out and have some quality that we're just barely getting covered. Yeah, they're very much set up for it. You got hurt. This is a thing and this is the constant state you're in. I am very different. I dislocate daily and a wrist dislocation, no big deal for me. But I also get femur dislocations, which are hell. And we had a good system going where I had Vicodin for the everyday pain. But they decided because the CDC put this blanket statement out in the cruelest possible way. And I used to get oxycodone for the extreme dislocations. But because my dislocations, the big ones were happening daily. So it's, I'm dealing with a massive traumatic injury every day. I can't decide how to take my meds because they only let me choose one opioid. So you can't even specialize for patients who have different disorders, which really made my doctor sad. He was like, this isn't fair to you, but it's what has to happen. It's true. They make you choose. It's one or the other because they won't give you what works for you that you were on because you keep getting ones that want to lower it and lower it. And they just uh, expect everybody to suffer. I really don't think they care. The last director for one of the pain clinics I was at, he put a statement out when he took over that said, I will reduce across the board 50%. It's like, that is the most irresponsible thing for a doctor to say. You're not even going to meet with each patient and see what each patient needs and what would be the best. You're going to make a unilateral statement of medication for incredibly complicated disorders that you're like, you're going to treat a cancer patient the same as you're going to do for like a post-surgery yeah. patient. Like what? Red flag. I'm, I'm right there with you. I think they saturated our system after it became politicized with that type of people. And those people don't care. They're just going to go by with what is said, whether it's harmful to the patient or the patient suffering severely, or they're dying. They don't care. And by the dying, I personally experienced this watching my father get given the equivalent of like Icodin while he was in the last hours of his life with pancreatic cancer. Like we were not worried when he had 24 hours to live if he was going to get an addiction. We asked specifically to ease suffering. We were very clear. So if you think you're not affected by this or you think you are super tough and can bootstrap through things, you cannot bootstrap through pancreatic cancer. I promise you.
You cannot bootstrap through things that you don't understand yet. Correct. So maybe just listen to the people who are experiencing this, help this out. I feel like our big takeaway is if you have a chronic long-term disorder, please, in whatever way you feel like you can, use a journal. Keep everything as organized as you can. If you want to do a lot of technical disability stuff, I can do a video on how to best use your apps to do this. If you are a tech genius out there, oh, my friend, please make an app. That would be great. iCal does not cover what we need. So that would be amazing. That's what I've been wanting to do is make an app. Oh my God. I have so many ideas and I have no energy. We need some help. Yep. We need some help. Yeah. And uh, social media people, can you please help us create some sort of hashtag so that we can post videos every day of what an opioid user's life is like? So that would be great. I feel like those are our takeaways. I think that's wonderful. So I end every episode with my favorite question because I'm always trying to get ideas. What's your favorite purchase that's made your life better and easier for under $100? Do you have anything that you're just like, that actually helped? I think it's a fellow. I think it's a neck. This neck yes. pillow. Oh, yes, cervical pillow. It's, it looks like yes. a regular pillow, but, but it's supposed to be for cervical. And yep. it's, oh, it's, I have full spinal pain, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. But I also have discs that are bad on top of my lumbar cages and all that stuff. Oh, and then my pot, and then my spondylosis, and then my fibro, and you know, I mean, all those other oh, things. Oh, I know. It's collect them all. We are, we are Pokemon disorders. I, yeah, I, I collected them all after the surgery. Yeah. Ponce is brutal. I hear you. I cannot thank you enough for coming on. It's a subject that is near and dear to my heart. So I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. And this is great. This brings more awareness and we, we can do more. Thank you for joining us today. To find out more about today's episode, including show notes, transcripts, and more, please visit invisiblenotbroken.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also support this show by heading over to our Patreon or by sharing these episodes. We are non-advertising, and our growth is thanks to you listeners. Thank you to our host Monica and Kim for a great conversation. This episode was edited by me, Luke Spine. Last but not least, be kind, be gentle, and be badass.